Okay, welcome to session nine of our summer school. Only one more to go after this one, and then we'll be um, done for the summer. But we do that every day. Okay, so let's have a look at today's lesson. Today we're going to be using our inference skills. So inference skills are massive in English. They're the 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 bits when you reason and go, ooh, that makes me think of, or maybe this is going to happen, or that gives me the sense that this might occur. And you're going to use clues from the text in for the, infer the thoughts and feelings of the characters today. OK, so we're going to be looking at chapters 22 and 23, Worldwide Whispers, Brendan the Bully and the Breaking News. And as always, before we do that, we're going to have a look at some vocab. Um, another big day for vocab. So we have got one, two, three, four, five, six words that we're going to have a look at today. OK. So, first word is scruples. I love this word. It's quite an old fashioned word. So, if you have scruples, you have beliefs about right and wrong that keep you from doing something that may be bad. So, synonyms for scruples are ethics, morals, beliefs, principles, values. But some of them have absolutely no scruples. So, I bet that's a word that you heard or have heard but didn't know the definition of. Okay, handed. So this is a verb. We can spot that it's a verb because of the ed. So often our verbs have the eds on the end. And you might recognise the word hound in there, which is obviously a type of dog. Okay, usually one that's used for hunting. So that should give you a sense of what the word means. So if you hound somebody, you are continually nagging them about something without stopping. So synonyms for hound are harassed, persecuted, pestered, annoyed, bothered, tormented. So it's really quite a bad word, isn't it, when you look at those other ones. And a teacher, probably Mrs Sanders herself, will be meeting you at the gates to make sure you don't get hounded by the odd reporter or two. OK, word number three, suspension. So a suspension is a punishment where somebody is temporarily not allowed to be somewhere. So if you're suspended from school or you're suspended from entering I don't know, a shop, it means that you're not allowed to go there temporarily. So synonyms for that are exclusion, removal, termination, elimination. Behaviour like this would usually lead to a temporary suspension from school. Okay, word number four, polite. Okay, so when people talk about the plight of someone, those people are in a dangerous, difficult or dangerous or unfortunate situation. So synonyms for plight are predicament, trouble, difficulty, mess or circumstances. So perhaps it is the actions of these children which will inspire political bodies across the world to finally heed the plight of refugee children everywhere. That is a really quite a difficult concept for a word. So a plight is the situation that somebody is in that's quite difficult or dangerous. Okay, word number five, hesitancy, that's a noun. So when you show hesitancy, you hesitate or pause before you do something. So hesitancy, the synonyms for that are doubt, uncertainty, indecision, dithering, reluctance. OK, so I feel quite um, hesitant, you know, when I'm um, doing something a bit risky or a bit dangerous, I'm quite a nervous person. But here we've got the example from the text. The decisive actions of these children have served to remind us of all the shameful hesitancy and fear which often govern our actions. Last but not least, disarray. OK, I love this word. Disarray. When things are in disarray, they're all confused and a mess. So sometimes my hair is in disarray. My room might be in disarray. My emotions might be in disarray. It's a wonderful word that can be used in lots of different contexts. So disorder, confusion, chaos, mess, shambles. So yesterday, so a centuries old tradition in disarray when the changing of the guard ceremony was disrupted by two nine year old children. So disarray means kind of chaos. OK, so as usual, head to your booklet, have a go at using those words in sentences of your own. Pause the video now. OK, so we're going to look at chapters 22 and 23. OK. Um, I'm just so chapter 22, Worldwide Whispers. Instead of going to work the next morning, Mum decided to walk to the bus stop with me. She said it's because me and Tom were famous now, and that even though we probably wouldn't be famous for more than a day, we needed to be careful. 
I just want to make sure you're not going to be chased by any reporters, she said, as she helped me put my coat on. Some of them are good people doing their job, but some of them have absolutely no scruples. I followed Mum out of the flat, wondering what scruples were, because Mum had looked angry when she had said the word, so I knew it was bad not to have any of them. I also wondered why reporters might chase us. Tintin, who has to be one of the best reporters in the world, only ever chased ch ch people who were kidnapped or thieves or had done something wrong. When we reached the bus stop, we found Tom's mum and dad there too. Mum went to talk to them and Tom and I huddled together. Tom said his parents had told him that if he ever ran away from school again, he would be so grounded that he would never see daylight again. But I told Mum it comes in through the curtains anyway, even when they're shut. And then we wa when we watched the news, the trees and companies said how brave I was, said Tom, scratching his head. I don't get it. I told him I didn't get it either, and about everything that had happened to me after I'd gotten home, so to all of the neighbours coming over, and about terrible Mr Gregg and how Mum had been angry one moment and then happy the next moment, and how she had laughed at what ta Sam the taxi man had said. Oh yeah, Dad gave him a cheer too, Tom grinned. I've never seen him cheer anything for anything before, except when we dropped off my nana at the airport after she'd been staying with us for a month. Okay, the kids probably don't get that joke, but we do. Okay, so let's look at that again. I've never seen him cheer for anything before, except when we dropped my nana off at the airport after she'd been staying with us for a month. We heard footsteps and Josie and Michael came running up to meet us. We saw you on the news. Did you give them the note? What did they say? As soon as Josie and Michael finished asking their questions, Tom and me took it in turn to answer them. As we were talking, lots of people gathered round and asked me and Tom if we were the kids from the news. We are about to say yes when Tom's dad called us over. Now listen up, said Tom's dad, kneeling down. There are going to be a lot of people wanting to ask you all sorts of things about yesterday. And whilst you can tell Josie and Michael and Mrs Sanders everything, and Mrs Carnice added, Yes, and Mrs Khan, and Miss Hemsey, asked Josie. OK, yes, her too, nodded Tom's dad, scratching his head in the exact same way Tom does when he's thinking. But if anyone else asks you what happened, I want you to say exactly what grown-ups say when they're famous and they've got to keep something a secret. Shall I tell you what that is? We all nodded and looked at each other excitedly. Famous grown-ups always say no comments when they want to keep something a secret, continued Tom's father. And that's what I want you to do. Let's all give it a practice right now. Tom, you go first. No comment, said Tom, thrusting his nose in the air. No comment, said Josie, grinning. No comment, said Michael seriously. No comment, I said loudly. Good, said Mum. Now, if anyone asks you why you went to Buckingham Palace or what the police said to you or anything about yesterday, you say... No comment, we all shouted, making all the people at the bus stop look over at us. My mum and Tom's mum and dad all smiled. Now there's a promise we want you all to make too. We want you all to promise that you won't look at the newspapers today. We all looked at each other, frowning a little, but nodded. Promise, said Tom's mum, not a single newspaper. We promise, we all said, although I could see Josie had her fingers crossed behind her back. Well, now I want to know what's in the newspapers. I guess we'll carry on and read and see what happens. Excellent, said Tom's dad, giving us all the thumbs up. Now we spoke to Mrs Sanders this morning, said Tom's mum, and a teacher, probably Mrs Sanders herself, will be meeting you at the gate to make sure you don't get hounded by the odd reporter or two. You'll be taken straight to our office because she needs to have a few words with you before, a few words with all of you before lessons start. Oh no, cried out Michael. Are we in trouble? Are my parents going to find out? It will be fine, son said Tom's dad, patting Mike on the back. I promise. Now go on, have a good day, said Mum, as our bus came to a loud hitting stop in front of us. And we'll see you tonight. You're all to come straight home, she shouted. We all nodded and waved and ran up to the top of the deck as usual. The other passengers looked at me and Tom with a frown before looking at their newspapers and then looking back at us again. We hurried past and sat together in a huddle. In whispers, Josie and Michael told us about their day yesterday. It had been exciting too. Josie said she'd have to make up a story involving a Chinese takeaway and endless buckets of puke to get Mrs Khan to believe I was sick, but would be back the next day. And Michael pretended to lose his voice that he didn't have to say anything to Mrs Khan when she asked him where Tom was. But of course he had kept forgetting that he was meant to have lost his voice, so Josie had to kick him lots of times to make him remember. And then when the police had run to tell Mrs Sanders what had happened, she had come and taken them both out of class and made her tell them everything. Er, uh, did Mrs Sanders say anything about giving us detention? asked Tom. Josie and Michael shook their heads. But Mrs Khan seemed upset, said Josie, looking down. I feel bad, to lying, uh, bad for lying to her. Me too, said Michael. Maybe we should make her a card, said Josie. Yeah, and I've still got some of the Queen's biscuits left over. We could give her those for tea, said Tom. 
but when we got to school we forgot all about Mrs Khan because the school was surrounded by hundreds of vans with large round satellite dishes on their roof and lights and microphones and fluffy grey things on sticks. Staring at us were hundreds of cameras on legs which looked like one-eyed insects that could zoom the eyes in and out and swivel their heads in any direction they wanted and all of them had lots of people bobbing up and down behind them. As we walked towards the gates a woman suddenly cried out there they are and started running towards us. I could see Mr Iron standing by the railings and looking at us. His eyes narrowed and his nose high in the air. His moustache was twitching. No comment, shouted Michael as he began running towards the school gates. We all ran too, but before we could reach them, lots of cameras and arms and legs had surrounded us and were blocking our way. What message were you trying to send to our government? Was this an act of protest on behalf of child refugees around the world? What was in the note? Who put you up to this? Where were you from? Were you born in this country? Would you like to tell us your story? Everywhere we looked, there were lenses and lights and loud clicking sounds. I clung on to Josie and Michael and Tom as the one-eyed machines all pushed us into a circle. I could hear Josie's breathing begin to wheeze. She doesn't like tight spaces. And my hands were beginning to sweat. Michael and me shouted, no comment, but I don't think anyone could hear us. So they definitely have no scruples, do they guys? They're just totally forgetting that these are, these are kids that, you know, they're not even 10. Everybody stand back right now, came a cry. And just as suddenly as the scary cameras and reporters and microphones had surrounded us, they all instantly moved away and we could breathe again. No shame at all, shouted the familiar voice, which was getting closer and closer to us. How dare you harass my kids? We saw Mrs Sanders push past the camera like a red-faced bull and reaching out a hand to us. Stay off school property, and if I see anyone near these kids again, I'll be calling the police and the Queen's Guards. Grabbing my hand, Mrs Sanders stormed back in through the school gates, pulling us like the tailing the trailing tail of a kite behind her. She stopped briefly in front of Mr Irons, who was now standing by the school doors. Mr Irons, you were specifically instructed to wait to bring these children safely. Where were you? Mr Irons gave us all a cold stare, his nose deadly quiet. I'm afraid I didn't see them, he said, his eyes narrowing even more and his moustache getting twitchier. You didn't see them? Stay here. I will speak to you later. Hello, Mrs Sanders. She's my kind of teacher. Throwing open the school doors, Mrs Sanders led us in and stopped to look down at us properly. She was angrier than I'd ever seen her, and her whole face was the colour of an extra bright pink peach. Are you all okay? she asked. Her voice was back to normal volume now, but was shaking. Say hi to my son, guys. Hey, wave, Theo. Wave at them. There we go. Mummy's just doing her story. You want to stay for the story? You want to sit Mummy's knee? Just going to... No. Nope. Okay, so we've been interrupted, guys. Hang on. He's not coming back. We're all right. <laughs> we all nodded, too stunned to say anything. Anyone hurt? We shook our heads. Good. Now all of you are going to go straight upstairs to my office, she ordered, looking over her glasses at us. You'll find Mrs Khan already there, along with our miss, Miss Fostermum and Miss Hemsby, and two police officers who want to have a quick word. I'll be up in just a minute. I need a word with Mr Irons. And waving us along, she hurried back outside. I think there are two types of being scared in the world. The first type is when you do something wrong, like breaking your mum's favourite vows by accident, and you're scared of her finding out. But at the same time, because she's your mum, you know that deep down she won't ever punish you too horribly because she knows that accidents happen. But then there's the other type of scared. It's when something you never ever thought would happen suddenly does, and the idea of it is so awful that you want to run away. I've only felt this type of scared once before, and that was when I saw Mum standing in the hospital corridor crane, and I knew right away that something bad had happened to my dad. I was feeling that second type of scared again now, and it made me want to be sick all over the floor. I'd never thought that the greatest idea in the world would get us into trouble with the police, and I never ever imagined it would get Armit into trouble too. I didn't want him to feel angry at us, but what if he hated us for not telling him our plan, and for the news people knowing about him, even though we hadn't meant to? Come on, said Josie, putting an arm over my shoulder, and together we all walked in silence up to Mrs Sanders' office. I took a deep breath and, fearing the worst, opened the door. But instead of angry stares and shaking heads, we found everyone smiling at us. Mrs Khan ran up and gave us all a hug, and so did Miss Hemsby, and Armet looked at us with his wide lion eyes and gave us a small wave. His foster mum was holding her hands to her lips as if she was praying and kept saying, You dear children! And there were two police officers standing near the door, but they didn't look angry either and just nodded and smiled at us. Come and sit down, said Mrs Khan, leading us to the four chairs that had been squeezed in front of Mrs Sanders' desk. We all sat down. I was still feeling jumpy inside, but at least I wasn't feeling sick anymore. 
As soon as Mrs Sanders get back, we want to hear all about what happened yesterday, said Mrs Khan. Miss Hemsby will translate everything for Ahmet, and we want you to take your time because it's all very important. But Miss, what about first period, whispered Michael, showing her his watch as it started flashing a blue colour. Just as he held it up, the bell for registration began to ring. He's back, guys. Mrs. Khan smiled. Don't worry, Miss Stevens has taken the class this morning. We immediately felt sorry for everyone in the class. Miss Stevens is planning to be teacher, but she's so boring and always spends so much time writing on the board that everyone hopes she won't ever really become one. Mrs. Sanders came in and, squeezing past everyone, sat down in her big chair that had squashed green velvet pillow on it. Right, she said, clapping her hands once. Begin. Slowly at first and then getting faster and faster and faster, we began to talk. We talked about how we became friends with Ahmet and how we wanted to help after finding out where his mum and dad might be. We talked about hearing that the border gates were going to be shut and about the plans we had come up to help. I could see Miss Hemsby explaining everything to Ahmet as we went and his eyes getting wider and wider. But it wasn't until I got out my exercise book and showed everyone the greatest idea in the world and the emergency plan that he jumped up from his seat and came to stand next to me. Miss Hemsby had to stand up too, as we continued to talk about the letter to the Queen and the presents we were meant to give her, and stand the taxi man and did into the paramedic and the extra extra special culturing guards who had given us their word. Nobody asked us any questions, not even one. They all just sat and listened and nodded as Miss Hemsby murmured what we were saying in our met's ear. It was strange having so many grown ups sit and listen, as if we were to them and they were us, but it felt good too. When we had said everything there was to say, Mrs. Sanders nodded and put her hands together. Well, she said, leaning mm. back in her chair, I hardly know what to say. She leaned forward and picked up my exercise book with the greatest idea in the world drawn in it. But what I can say is that Ahmet is very, very lucky to have friends who are so passionate about helping him find his family. Mrs. Khan nodded too, and I saw the two police officers nodding too. Now, just to be clear, said Mrs. Sanders, peeving over her glass at us, what you did was extremely dangerous, and your plan, or the likes of it, must never ever be attempted again. Do you understand? We all nodded silently. I could feel my cheeks getting hot, and I saw Tom's ears instantly turn bright red. You lied to Mrs. Khan, you left school without permission, and you put yourselves in great danger. Behaviour like this would normally lead to a temporary suspension from school. Josie gasped and Michael winced. I could hear Tom swallowing nervously and even Armet looked scared. Mrs Sanders went on. However, we've spoken to all your parents and I can understand fully that your thoughts that this was an emergency. So, I looked up at Mrs Sanders and could feel everyone doing the same. In this instance, she will not be suspended. Tom yelped a small yes. And Josie let out a huge puff of air that had been making her cheeks swell. And Michael gave a long sigh. And as soon as Miss Hemsby had told him what had happened, Ahmet cheered and clapped. But even though I felt happy too, I couldn't feel fully happy because I still wanted to know something. And what about Ahmet's family, Miss? Has the Queen found them already? Mrs Sanders shook her head and slowly leaned forward. I think you should all know that the Queen, well, there are some things that even she can't do. But she's the Queen, frowned Tom. She can do whatever she wants. I could see Ahmet staring at Mrs Sanders as if she wasn't making any sense to him either. But Mrs Sanders was shaking her head. I'm afraid that's not quite true. I'm sure that the Queen would like to try and help Armit in some way, but I doubt very much that she'd be allowed to send out extra people to find his family, especially when no one knows where they are. On hearing Mrs Sanders' words, I felt something hard hit me in the middle of the chest. I wanted to tell her that she was wrong, that the Queen could help anyone if she really wanted to, but even though my mouth opened, I couldn't say, I couldn't say any words. I know this, that may come as a huge disappointment, asked Mrs Sanders, peering over her glasses at us and looking at me the longest. But Ahmet has lots of people trying to find him, to help him find his parents. Though even if they do find them, it may take a long time, months maybe, even years before they can join him here. That's why he's staying with Miss York for now, he, I, she added, nodding at Ahmet's foster mum. We all stayed quite silent, and even though I didn't want them to, I could feel my eyes beginning to get wet and my nose tickling and something heavy singing in the pit of my stomach. Everything we had done had been for nothing, and the greatest idea in the world was already the stupidest idea in the world. In fact, it was probably the stupidest idea in the whole universe, and I knew that everyone was thinking it too. Now, said Mrs Sanders kindly, I want to show you something, and she took a newspaper from out of her bag and laid it on the desk in front of us. I looked over at Michael and Tom and Josie, but I think they must have all forgotten about the promise we made, because they immediately started to read the paper. So I wiped my eyes and looked at it too. 
I knew that it had to be okay to break a promise to your mum if your head teacher was telling you to. A huge headline stared at us from the front page, and alongside it was a large blurry image of me running up to one of the Queen's guards with Tom behind me. I could tell it was me because of my bright blue rucksack, but I couldn't see my face properly at all. The paper looked like this. London. Who, London News. Who is Ahmet and how can we help? Nine-year-old Storm Palace in bid to help refugee boy. The story said that the newspaper was going to run an international appeal to find Ahmet's parents, which made Josie grin and whisper, see? This is what it said. Yesterday afternoon, so a centuries-old tradition in disarray, with the changing of the guard ceremony was disrupted by two nine-year-old children. Breaking through the barriers, they attempted to give one of Her Majesty's palace guards a written note, asking the Queen to help them find and find the family of a refugee boy only known as Ahmet. The decisive actions of these children have served to remind us all of the shameful hesitancy and fear which often govern our actions and those of our government. So who is Ahmet and where is his family? This paper is determined to help and urges our readers, our leaders and our politicians to do what they can not to only find this young boy's missing family, but to reunite them here on UK soil. Perhaps it is the actions of these children which will inspire political bodies across the world to finally heed the plight of refugee children everywhere. A fitting testament indeed to a young boy, whose story we have yet to learn, made infamous by a daring act of true friendship. We appeal to all of you not to let the brave actions of these children be in vain. Help us find Ahmet's family. After she'd finished, Mrs Khan put the paper down and looked at us with her eyebrows raised. So, you see, she said, clasping her hands together and placing them under her chin, all is not lost. Even if the Queen can't do as much as she'd like to, there is a whole world of people who are whispering Ahmet's name and trying to think of how to help instead. Later that morning, as I sat in lessons, I thought about what Mrs Sanders had said. I thought about the worldwide whispers being whispered right now at that very moment and wondered how long it would take for all of them to reach the border gate people and Ahmet's mum and dad too. I'd never thought about how loud a whisper can be if there are lots and lots of them. So all that day I whispered help Ahmet out loud too whenever I could. So did Tom and Michael and Josie. And whenever we did it together, our whispers made us all sound like an ocean. Chapter 23, Brendan the Bully and the Breaking News. There are some days that you never ever want to forget, like birthdays and school trip days and adventure days. And there are other days when you want to forget everything that ever happened, like when a bully bullies you or a grown up tells you off for doing something you didn't do, or when someone you love most in the world suddenly dies. And then there are roller coaster days. Those are the days when one moment you're so happy that you feel like it's your birthday, but the next you feel so sad that you want to hide in your bed until everything is over. That Friday, the day after we'd learned about the worldwide whispers, was a roller coaster day. After the morning register, Mrs. Khan suddenly told everyone to leave their things on their desks because we had to go to an emergency school assembly. We only ever have an emergency assembly if something bad has happened, like a fight or if something's been stolen from a teacher. But Josie clapped her hands and asked, do you think they found Ahmed's parents already? That made my heart leap up and feel like it was flying. Maybe the emergency assembly was for that. I looked over at Ahmet and gave him an excited wave, but the assembly wasn't for that at all. Mrs Sanders only wanted to tell everyone to be on the best behaviour, even the teachers, because the reporters surrounding the school were clearly not going anywhere anytime soon and had put the school firmly on the world's radar. Hearing this made everyone sit up straight, just in case there was a giant radar being beamed down from outer space to spy on us. Then Mrs Sanders said that if anyone spoke to a reporter about me, Tom or Ahmet or asked us any questions about what's happened, the police would know and they might be expelled. This made everyone turn around and stare at us and I could hear Jenny saying loudly, see, I told you it was true, they did break into the Queen's house. And someone else replied, they should have worn a mask then they wouldn't have been caught. But we didn't mind and Josie and Tom even started acting like famous people and began waving at everyone. But as we were leaving the assembly hall, Brendan the bully pushed past us and whispered, smelly refu refuge bag at Armet, and Chris and Liam punched their fists into the hands, which meant they were going to beat us up. I thought we should tell Mrs Khan and Mrs Sanders right away, but Armet told me not to. He said bullies that talk, just talk, are better than bullies that actually punch, because words don't hurt as much. I don't agree. Dad always used to say that words can hurt more than punches, because when you get a bruise or a bump after being punched, it disappears after a while and you can forget all about it. But words can stick around for a long time and the meanest words stick around the longest. Tom didn't think Ahmet was right either and said we should pull down Brendan the bully's pants in PE. Josie thought we would say, should save up all our pocket money and pay one of the bigger bullies to bully him for us. But then Michael said that bullying a bully was silly and that we should just ignore him. So that's what we all agreed to do except we couldn't. 
because at first break, Brendan the bully started to do something which made me hate him more than anything I'd ever hated in my whole life, even beat Reed to Mr Irons. Mrs Khan said we should never ever hate anyone because hating someone can eat up your insides and gives you heart disease, but sometimes you can't help it. And I especially couldn't help it when I heard Brendan the bully and Liam and Chris singing the song they had made up. The song went like this, Ahmet the refugee smells like poo, so we're going to stuff him in a bag and flush him down the loo. Very original guys. I got so angry that as soon as I heard it, I shouted at them to shut up and leave Armit alone. And so did Michael and Josie and Tom. But that only made them sing it louder and louder and louder, which made Armit's face get redder and redder and redder. I looked around for a teacher to tell, but Mr Irons was the only teacher I could see on duty. And I could see right away that he'd heard Brendan the bully's song too and wasn't going to do anything about it. He just stood and watched us with his nose in the air. By the time Brendan the Bully had begun to sing the song for the fourth time, I think all of us had forgotten what Mrs Sanders had said about everyone being on their best behaviour and the giant radar and about there being lots of reporters everywhere, because suddenly, without even thinking about it, I made a running lunge for Brendan the Bully, and Tom and Josie and Michael did the same. We all crashed into each other and falling, flay, fall into the floor, began punching and kicking Brendan the Bully, and Liam and Chris just as hard as we could. I think I must have been punched and kicked back too, but I was so angry I couldn't feel everything. Armit stood frozen to the floor and watched us, not knowing what to do, but after a few seconds he roared and jumping on top of the brand and the bully began to hit him as hard as he could too. The fight didn't last for more than a minute because a few seconds after we'd fallen to the floor we could hear a whist whistles hurrying our way and clicking noises like camera buttons being pressed as lots of parents' hands started to pull us away. We were marched into school and up the stairs and the next thing I knew we were all standing at Mrs Sanders' office being stared at angrily but not only by Mrs Sanders but by Mrs Khan and Miss Hemsby too. I couldn't really hear what they were saying because my ears had become so hot, but I think I heard the words ashamed, never in the history of the school, and parents being said. We all got a detention for fighting, even Armour. But it wasn't all bad. When my ears had cooled down and Josie had told me that when Mrs Sanders had heard Brendan the Bully's song, she had given him and Liam and Chris two weeks detention and said she would be calling their parents too. But as it turned out, Brendan the Bully's punishment was more serious than even we could have imagined, because by that very evening, Brendan the Bully and Mr Irons were breaking the news. Ooh, this is good. Bit, bit of karma, this, isn't it? On every single channel, in all the weekend papers, headlines like, video of bullying bully attacking refugee boy sparks outrage, and teach stands aside as school bully threatens refugee boy, and school bully trash talks refugee child were everywhere. But by Monday morning, the school was surrounded by even more cameras and reporters and bands with satellite dishes on their roofs than before. Brendan the bully and Liam and Chris didn't come to school for three whole days after they had broken the news. And when they did, their parents came with them and made them apologize to Armit in front of everyone at morning assembly. They still had to do, do detention every day for two weeks to. It made everyone glad they'd been caught by the news people. Brenton the bully still looked at Armit with a horrible scowl on his face whenever he thought no one could see him. And one time in the lunch hall, he walked right up to Armit with his fists clenched as if he wanted to punch him. But instead of being scared, Armit just looked at him with his lion eyes and grinned. After that, Brendan the bully never went near Armit again. And just when we thought things couldn't get any better, that week, Mr Irons and his whistling nose disappeared too and were never heard of again. Boring Miss Stevens have to take over his class, which probably made them just as miserable as they had been before. But no one else really cared about that, because now everyone was free to scream and laugh and shout as much as they wanted to at break times again. So we did, except when we all screamed and laughed and shouted louder and longer and harder than we ever done before. Because when you're playing with your friends and don't have any bullies to worry about anymore, that's exactly what you should be doing. Okay, so we're going to have a look at our inference skills here. So we know that the reporters were all outside listening to this. Um, so when we heard Brendan the Bully singing this song, okay, so I'm not going to repeat it because it's awful, it's on the screen there for you and it's in your booklet. What did you think as a reader when you heard this song that Brendan the Bully was singing? So what were your feelings about it? Did you think it was funny? What did you think might happen from that? So have a go. And completing that in your book club. Okay, this one. Why do we think the children lost control of their actions and couldn't help attacking the bu bullies? So what made them lose complete control at this bit? Okay, so why do you think they behave that way? How do you think the parents of the bullies felt when they found out what their ch children were doing? So how do you think 
Brendan's mum and dad and Liam's mum and dad and Chris's mum and dad, how do you think they felt when they had to go into school and apologise in front of their assembly? Because remember, this had been on the news. Do we think that Brendan, Liam and Chris are bullies because of their parents? Do we think that um, they knew anything about this? Is this something they've heard at home? So in your own words, in your booklet, how do you think the parents of the bullies felt when they found out what their children were doing to Armet and Armet's friends? Okay, to those exits, three questions. One, what do you think happened to Mr. Irons? Okay, where do you think he went? What do you think happened to him? Question two, have the news reporters, in your opinion, been a good or a bad thing? And the final question, and we can debate the answer to this in September, who do you think is the nastiest character that we've come across in the book so far and why? So it may not be the automatic one, Brendan the bully, it may be somebody else. Okay, that's the end of session nine, and I will see you tomorrow for session 10, the final one. Thank you.